Dr. Mike Isratel here for Renaissance Periodization, asking a very strange question in today's talk. Is periodization important for muscle growth? Another way we can think about it is splitting up training into cycles is something that people think about as periodization. The microcycle, the mouse cycle, the block, and the macro cycle. And that's essentially the same idea as this sort of phasic approach to training. Now, that actually has its own term. It's part of periodization. It's called phase potentiation. People say, is periodization important in hypertrophy training or for muscle growth? What they actually mean to say is, is phase potentiation important? Phase potentiation says that what you do in one week changes what you're going to do in the next, and that sets up the next week. This is why we don't go all the way to crazy failure with super high volumes in week one of a program, because we know that week two leaves us nowhere to go. We know we're going to hold it back a little bit on the first week so that the next week is going to be tougher and more overloading, and then more and more and more, and then that sets up all the other weeks so we have great productive training. You can kind of think of it like a full course meal, but I assume <laughs> that the appetizer sets you up for the excellent main course. And then the excellent main course does its own job well, but it's also not too much food so that you have room for dessert. So a relatively high volume mesocycle, a much higher volume mesocycle, and potentially sequencing entire blocks of roughly three mesocycles with the effects of it are very notable after years of applying it. And for the advanced, these effects are incredibly notable. However, for beginners, which are by definition people that haven't been trained that long, there's almost no effect. Just train pretty hard and work on really good technique and stick to consistency and adherence. If you get really tired, take a week off or a week of much lighter training. And for intermediates, in the medium term, in the, in the case of like months, and remember almost all studies on this are on beginners for months, maybe weeks, and sometimes intermediates for months or weeks, there's almost no actual effect that's detectable, right? So this stuff only really shows itself after months and years, especially in the advanced. But if you're advanced and you only try it for a few weeks, which I don't even know what, what there is to face potentiate much in a few weeks, then you'd be like, ah, it's all periodization, it's all super overcomplicated, just train hard, brother. You're gonna run into some problems and we'll show you what kinds. All right, so if face potentiation doesn't actually make a big difference for intermediates, what does make a big difference for intermediates? What should you be focusing as far as the whole background of periodization if phase potentiation is not it? So phase potentiation is actually second to last. They need to focus on specificity, overload, and fatigue management. What does this mean? For specificity, for intermediates, that means train the muscles you want to grow with exercises and techniques that target the muscles as limiting factors. Um, I'm doing tons of squats, like everyone said, when I was a beginner, it worked, but like squats just don't grow my quads anymore. What do I do? Well, as an intermediate, it's time to really focus on specificity. So it's time to ask yourself, do I feel my quads in the squat? Like, not really, I mostly feel my glutes. Is Are the quads what fail when I'm squatting all the way close to, super close to failure? Like, no, actually my lower back just starts to get tired and that's why I have to rack the weight. Well, gee whiz, you're doing a really bad job on specificity. That's the most important training principle. So it's no, it's no, it's no surprise your quads aren't growing. So either alter your squat stance or switch to another exercise as a first exercise that really taxes your quads. Maybe you switch to hack squats as a first exercise, still squatting, but later in the program. So it's super important that you get that right. Otherwise you just float along for years, not growing certain muscles. Number two, overload. It means train hard and make the training harder over time. Fundamentally, overload means training harder Maybe not then the exact last time, but look, over time, you got to train hard. And a lot of intermediates miss this last part. Fatigue management is crucial. And for them, that means, first of all, not training more than they, they can recover from. If you've tried 20 sets of chest for weeks on end and your chest just gets tired and you get weaker and you get hurt, stop doing that. Try 10 sets of chest per week and see if you can slowly work up to 12 or 15. Every roughly four to eight weeks, you're gonna have to take it easy, either take a week off or take a week of deload to refresh and recharge and keep going. When does face potentiation actually become more important? Well, just by sticking to specificity, overload and fatigue management, you'll get amazing gains for years. Maybe the first five years of your training career, maybe even longer. Now, eventually towards the end of that five year period, you'll have to start focusing on the training principles that are between the first three and face potentiation, which is to say, you'll have to find a frequency that works for you for some muscles and maybe start altering your frequency a little bit here and there. Like 
You can get great gains training your biceps once a week for a little while as a beginner, but as an intermediate, you might realize that two and three times a week bicep training just works way better. And somebody might have told you, here's a really great program where you train your hamstrings four times a week, but you can't do that because you can't personally recover from it. So you might have to adjust your frequency to two times a week or something like that. Variation, right? Variation is something you'll have to figure out. You'll have to choose the right exercises for you. You'll have to choose the right loading ranges or the fractions of the loading ranges you use. Do you train mostly heavy, mostly light, or mostly in between? And the right kind of tempos. Do you do slow eccentrics? When do you do those? And of course, knowing when to rotate them in and out. When have squats become stale? When have leg presses become stale? When is it time to replace with hack squats? So on and so forth. And of course, all of this is threaded in with individualization. Which one of these work best for you? Maybe not. So learning yourself is a big part. So you'll be doing a lot of that. Your deloads will no longer get rid of all of your fatigue, right? There's some psychological fatigue, some hormonal fatigue, and some joint and connective tissue fatigue that just hangs around longer than a week. And you'll realize that longer phases of easier training, two to four weeks of active rest or resensitization, will just be something you have to do, otherwise you won't be able to train hard continuously. Ronnie Coleman, Joe Rogan interview, where he talks about coming back full steam after time off, 600 pounds for reps the first time I come back from the gym after a long layoff, I went to 300 and then worked my way up, which is insulting. It's Ronnie Coleman. Why is he squatting 300 pounds? He realized he would just get hurt. You're going to start to realize that after you come back from downtimes, going full steam like crazy is a really, really bad idea. So your first mesocycle back, you'll train pretty hard, but ease into it. Your second mesocycle after that, you'll be able to train meat and potatoes like you always did. And then you realize that the super high frequencies and high volumes that you can handle the very highest can be done maybe for one last mesocycle, but then you just, you're done and you have to take that active rest phase. So you can buy yourself a little bit of time to do your best, 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 but then it falls off. So in the end, you're going to have rediscovered this face potentiated structure. That's what you're doing, right? You are now taking longer phases of rest. You are coming back and sequencing mesocycles from easiest or least hard to more hard to hardest, unsustainable, relax and repeat. And now you're doing face potentiation. Almost all pro bodybuilders do it, whether or not they call it that. And most of them don't because most of them don't have sports science degrees, but they don't need them because they've intuitively landed to this. Reminder though, science is still important because some folks, you know, intuitively will land there and be successful. Some folks will get career ending injuries or burn out completely before they ever do it. We have a survivorship bias. People say, well, the pros know it all. We have the ones that are left over. But how many people, had they known sports science before, would have succeeded, but because they didn't, they have to discover the hard way. Remember, trial and error works really well if you succeed. Trial and error, if it's on an individual basis, means you erred, you tore your quad off your bone, you don't get to continue trial and error. So it's always good to have this knowledge ahead of time so that you don't have to discover it for yourself. But over time, bodybuilders, on the aggregate, you know, they have discovered this for themselves and most do it. Most pros take one to three months off every single year off of the gym and all their special sports supplements and all that stuff. Or they just do super easy training. A lot of people are surprised it took three months off after every single Olympia show period and he needed it, right? See you next time.